Welcome to Hoosier Game Day, presented by the Hoosier Network. As always, Ryan Canfield, Liv Clements with yes. you. Liv, Indiana's 8-0. Oh, Jesus. That sounds awesome. Ooh. That is really, really great. And it's a big week <laughs> in all of the Big Ten. Yes. But we cannot go any further than Indiana, Michigan State. Mm. But first, last week, Hoosiers beat Washington yep. in a really, really great week for the entire city of Bloomington. It was, it was quite awesome. What did you take away from all the pageantry last week? I mean, last it was crazy last week because college game day came to Bloomington and the hype was there. And then I used starting quarterback to Al and now Taven's in. And so there's a lot of pressure on this team to not fold under the pressure of the media, but also the switching up of quarterbacks. But they came up to the plate and they did what they needed to do. It looked a little rocky in the beginning. I think Hoosier fans were on the fence a little bit, but a sold out stadium that was huge. And they had the Signetti towels. So the hype was there, but I think this team really stepped up to the plate with adversity. They really did what they needed to do. Yeah, and we'll get to it after we get to highlights. But, you know, they kind of faced the first real sets of adversity yeah. mm -hmm. all season. And people had been saying, well, they haven't had faced any adversity. Or, you know, you just beat teams. That's not adversity. I mean, right. e even if you're crushing teams, you can't complain about not mm -hmm. facing adversity. But it's been really, really great to see. And, I mean, Indiana has everything to play for. And the, and seeing how the Big Ten could shake up this week, it is, it's really, really cool. And it's also a trophy game this week. Yeah. The old brass spittoon <laughs> will be up for grabs in East Lansing. Spartans took it back last season after the Hoosiers took it two seasons ago. But before we can go any further on Michigan State, we have to get to the Washington game. With the eyes of the college football world waking up to Indiana University on college game day, the Hoosiers needed to prove to the ill-informed that they can ball. Let's go field level to Memorial Stadium. On the first snap of the game, the pocket collapses on UW quarterback Will Rogers. It's Sean Asbury, the quarterback, getting in for a big loss. And on that same drive, third and eight for Rogers, he gets pressured by Mikhail Kamara. You see him throw the ball away, but he'd get flagged for intentional grounding. The Hoosier offense couldn't get it done on its first drive, but have no fear. D'Angelo Pons jumps this screen. It's only green grass in front of him. 69 yards for the pick six. Look at that shot of the sold-out Memorial Stadium. The Huskies would turn the ball over and force a Hoosier punt. But on the ensuing drive, Rodgers goes deep for Boston, but Pons is there again to make a remarkable tip job interception. And two plays later, Taven Jackson goes over the middle to find Omar Cooper Jr., the defender can't get him, and OCJ is in the end zone 42 yards later. But the Huskies will finally put together a good drive here on the ensuing drive. Jonah Coleman goes 46 yards through a slew of Hoosier defenders to the IU 19 to set up Washington for the second and goal. Short end around to Giles Jackson. Washington would cut the lead in half 14 to 7. Now to end the second half, Indiana would run out of time on three plays from the one yard line. They'd settle for the three and go into the locker room up 10, 17-7 Indiana. Now here's where things get interesting. First play of the second half, Taven Jackson is going to look for Omar Cooper. He throws in a highly contested window, forces a deflection, and gets into the hands of Jacob Bandis. Washington would take advantage, and they respond with this score from this QB keeper from Desmond Williams. It's 17-14, and Indiana needed a good full drive here, and they would get it. They stem together their best drive of the afternoon. It starts with Justice Ellison weaving through Washington defenders for 10 yards. And then the next play, Taven Jackson would find Miles Price over the middle for a nice chunk play. Then from five yards down on first down, it's Justice Ellison taking names, bringing the boom, serving justice however you want to say it. It's a 10-point lead for Indiana in the third quarter. Washington would try to get things back going on this carry from, from Jonah Coleman to the IU 44. The drive would saw after a Hoosier sack. Indiana would force this punt, and on the punt, Jack McAllister, he drives Miles Price back to the 21-yard line, and he would not only make up the ground that he lost, but weave through some Huskies all the way down to the Hoosier 15, giving Jackson and company some very nice room to work. And then the drive is capped off by this QB keeper by the Greenwood product. Jackson was very, very good in filling in for Curtis Rourke, and that would do it. Indiana, 8-0 for the first time since 1967. So, Liv, after seeing all these highlights, what was the biggest part about this game? Yeah, I think the biggest part about this game is how they came out in the second half. I think the big thing was, of course, going into the game, Taven being on the spot. If they win, good job, Taven. If they lose, well, Taven, it's your fault. And luckily, he's figuring out how to come out with the win. So that was a big thing. But coming into that second half, 
it was still a little bit rocky that first half. I think Taven had some good moments. I think the offense had good moments, but the defense was really the star. So the big thing coming in the second half was can the offense still keep that momentum they had in that first half, and they did, and they came with the win. So the team worked. Yeah, absolutely. And you're going to touch on it with one of our first guests, Nick Rotocap, in just a mm-hmm. second. But, I mean, I kind of want to talk about Taven for a second. I yeah. mean, he was, he was, I mean, nowhere near Curtis Rourke good, but, you know, no. You, you get you get to A and O, you get the win. It was it was really nice to see, and he kept the composure even after yep. after the interception. Which I mean, kind of, I mean, it was his fault for throwing it into you know that 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 yep. tight window. But I mean, what are you gonna do with that big deflection? But I thought he was good. I mean, you're certainly gonna take it with the win, especially yeah. in this high of leverage. Right. And uh, it was it was really really great. And uh, all signs point to Curtis Rourke playing Ooh. tomorrow. So, uh, and do you have confidence in Taven Jackson if they need him against Michigan mm-hmm. State? I I do, I do have. Okay, so this one, this was, I have faith in Taven if they need him in Michigan State. But I think the faith comes from the offense working so well. The O line's good, and the receivers and running backs are good. So that helps him. I think that's what will take it. If they need him for Michigan State. You can rely on every single piece of the offense to help him and back him if he's not having a great game. So it's not, I think, he can carry this team to a win, but if the offense is clicking and helps him out, and also if the defense also keeps – I honestly, if the defense stays on the field longer than the offense does, I feel like that will also help him. So I feel like, like you said, yes, he rebounded from that interception and figured it out, but the offense is clicking. Yes, Taven can go in and play, and I think it'll be fine. I absolutely agree. If they play turnover-free – Yep mistake-free football, you know, no fumbles, no interceptions. They can beat the teams that they are better than. It won't be a blowout if Taven's the quarterback. Okay. I think it will be a close game. All right, so it's now your turn yes. to be with one of our special guests. Nick Rodekap will be in this seat <laughs> in just a second. Welcome back. Liv Clements, as always, and we are here with Nick, and we do pack through our podcast together, so we have some of his thoughts, but I want to just give IU update on this team, okay? And you do so good at breaking it down. So the first big news was EJ Williams decided to leave, okay? Why would he do that when a team is potentially probably going to the playoffs? Well, EJ Williams really only had, I think, two catches right. all season, mm-hmm. um, about at the halfway mark, and he wasn't 100%. He said in a social media statement that he wanted to get surgery so that he could get 100% healthy and come back and be 100%, but the coaching staff viewed that as him quitting on the team. And there was some disagreement that maybe if he were to come back, he wouldn't be allowed a roster spot. So he decided to hit the transfer portal. He only played in four games, so he gets to keep that eligibility. And I think it's ultimately the best decision for him Mm -hmm. in the long term. This Indiana receiver room is so deep that Williams, who was a very talented recruit coming out of high school, really could just never break through. It came down to him not being available when other guys were, similar to what happened with Donovan McCulley. And ultimately, I think there just wasn't a spot for him on this roster. Do you feel like for IU fans, that might be like, why are people leaving this team that's so good? It's just, do you feel like it it doesn't hurt the team in that aspect? I mean, you look at the impact that guys like Williams and Donovan McCauley Mm -hmm. had this year. It was very limited. And McCauley was good last year. But again, this receiver room is one of the deepest in the conference. They've got six or seven guys who can go out and make a catch one-on-one. So really, it's just a product of the roster construction, and I don't know if it's an indictment on the players so Mm -hmm. much as it is just how good Kurt Signetti has been at recruiting high-end talent and attracting it to Bloomington, which some people thought was impossible. And so you talked about that receiver room, which is a big reason why this team is now potentially going to go 9-0, and they're ranked 13, but they beat Washington, they don't move. Stay right at 13, okay? Can you break it down for us what that means, why they didn't move, should they have moved, and the CFP rankings come out next week? Yeah, I I think that it's a combination of the teams above Indiana not really losing or being on bye weeks, and then also just the fact that a lot of the AP poll comes from preseason bias or brand bias, and I said this on Pack the Rock a few days ago, (laughs) but if Indiana had a, a, a yellow block M or a block O or an ND next to their name, they'd probably be in the top 10 or the top five. But because Indiana was picked at the bottom of the Big Ten, as Kurt Signetti so aptly pointed out at Big Ten Media Days, Mm -hmm. and really, they're just supposed to be a bad team. It's like, oh, well, they might be winning, but it's not legit. So we're not going to move them up, even when they might deserve to be moved up. And again, I said this on Pack the Rock, you keep winning, eventually people are going to have to give you respect where it's due. And also the big thing, too, is that 
the college football playoff rankings come out on November 5th, which, of course, is election night. So that's going to be a fun uh, a fun combo for sports <laughs> fans across the country. But the great thing about the CFP rankings is they take into account things that the AP voters don't, because a lot of AP voters cover one team. They can only watch one full game. So the college football playoff is going to look at some of those more advanced metrics and give a more accurate view of where Indiana stands relative to the rest of the country. And so when you look at them beating Washington, do you feel like there was a possibility they would have moved up if Work was quarterback? Eh, I don't think it really matters. Okay. I think, you know, a win's a win, and Indiana wasn't pass first yep. against Washington. I mean, Justice Ellison carried Ooh. that team, and the defense saved them in Literally the first carried. half. Yeah. Kurt Signetti's <laughs> words, not mine. Um, but no, I don't think it matters who's at quarterback, especially since Curtis Work will be back against Michigan State. That was what Kurt Signetti announced last night on the radio show. I, I don't really think this isn't like a Florida State Jordan Travis situation. Right. Um, and, you know, if Taven has to fill in for Curtis, I think he can manage the game. He can make plays when he needs to, especially as he continues to get more reps. But I don't really know that the AP poll had anything to do with, you know, Curtis not being behind center against Washington. And so when it comes to the remainder of the season, Michigan, Ohio State, New Purdue. Where do you have IU finishing out this season? I, I think the safe prediction, I can't believe I'm saying this, but the safe <laughs> prediction is 11 and 1. Okay. Um, I really, I do believe that Indiana has the physicality up front. They've got the versatility in their offense to be able to take the games against mm. Michigan State, Michigan, and Purdue. Ohio State, very tough team. I mean, they played Oregon down to the wire, and that was in Eugene. So, you know, they'll have the home crowd 100,000 strong behind them. Thanksgiving, the weekend before Thanksgiving, it's going to be packed in Columbus. That is going to be the most hostile environment Indiana has played in as a program in a very long time. Um, but I, I do think there's a possibility they could be spoilers against Ohio State, especially depending on how the Penn State-Ohio State game plays out this weekend. Okay. Um, but I, I do think 11-1 and one is kind of the safe prediction. And even still, if Indiana were to lose against Ohio State, you think back to what happened in 2020, right. Indiana kept it very close, and they were in the top 12 in the final college football playoff rankings. So it's something to keep in mind. You play them close, the committee sees that, they're like, okay, we want this team on a national stage. Do you feel like even if they lose but keep it close, that still has them in possible playoff prediction? Absolutely. And, you know, it's one thing if they get walled by 35 points right. because then it's clear that Ohio State's on another level. But I think Indiana can hang with them. And I do believe, you know, if they keep it within 10 points, keep it within two touchdowns, I, I don't like the idea of a quality loss, yeah. but I don't think that the committee can ignore Indiana in that situation. And so for Michigan State this weekend at Michigan State, what do you have your score prediction? I'm um, thinking with Curtis Rourke being back, that definitely helps mm -hmm. Indiana open up the passing game. Michigan State's pass defense isn't great. Their run defense right. a little better. Right. Um, so I do think it'll be a test for Curtis Rourke to see, you know, is he 100%? There's a difference between being able to play and being able to play at full strength. So I do think Indiana's going to have to lean on their defense a little bit, lean on the guys up front on both sides of the ball who have been fantastic this year. I'm going to say it's going to be 35 to, we'll call it 17. Okay. So Indiana. we're in the same in the same margin a yeah. little bit. Okay, perfect. Well, Nick, I appreciate you always give us a great breakdown, so we appreciate it. We're gonna go ahead and go to the next thing, and we'll be right back. All right. First of all, great breakdown from Nick, especially in the aspect of the college football playoff rankings. We will definitely see that on Tuesday. But now it is time to preview this week's matchup with my good friend, roommate, partner of the college football show, Jack Garrett. How are we doing this morning, Ryan? I mean, it's. it's it's great. It's a great start to the weekend. It's the uh, first day of November, and Indiana is undefeated. Indiana is undefeated. 8-0. Not a lot of people maybe thought that we would be here at this point. I think the, uh, the possibility was certainly there uh, when the schedule came out. I know we had a lot of conversations about it, but I don't know if anyone realistically expected this team to be 8-0 at this point. Going into Michigan State, uh, looking for a big-time win. Well, yeah, when you mention that, I mean, the conversations that were had, I mean, you see, they're better, like, we, we were saying, and this was probably in February, he said, this recruiting class, this coaching staff is all going to mesh together so great, but can they beat Nebraska? Can they beat Washington? Because we had no idea what they would look like. Can they beat Ohio State? And so the fact that they are actually doing it is, is quite remarkable. Yeah, absolutely. I think going into the year, you know, you looked at games like Ohio State as there's absolutely no way Indiana uh, competes in that game. I think a lot of people felt that way about Michigan as well. But now you're looking at that Ohio State game just a, just a few weeks away, and you're thinking, Indiana can they go undefeated and, and get to Indianapolis the first weekend or the first yeah the first weekend of December? 
uh, conversations that a lot of people never thought we would have about Indiana football. And plus, they have breathing room. They have breathing room, stemming together great wins, probably not against the best opponents, but great performances. Uh, but now, let's talk about MSU. So, first year under head coach Jonathan Smith, that took over for Mel Tucker. What is the bread and butter of this Michigan State team? It's absolutely the run game, and I think it should be. It's, it's such a young team. Jonathan Smith uh, brings in Aiden Childs with him from Oregon State. He's been running the offense, and, and he's been a little shaky at times, but he's had Kron Lich Adams and Nate Carter uh, in the backfield with him to, to help him out. So I think continuing into this Indiana game, I, I fully expect Michigan State to try and control the ground game. Yeah, and when you when you see have a guy like Nate Ch or excuse me, Aiden Childs, you know, as a pessimistic Michigan fan, I just see oozing upside. But I mean, this touchdown to, tur to turnover ratio, Seven to nine inter seven touchdowns to nine interceptions. Had a bad fumble last week as well. But you know, where can he get Indiana with you know with flat feet? The, th the thing with with Childs is he reminds me a lot of an Anthony Richardson kind of guy, uh, kind of inaccurate, uh, but he makes a big play every now and again, and it's one of the more impressive plays that you'll ever see. So for me. It's really limiting those big plays, keeping the ball in front of you, uh, don't get beat over the top, and let him make the mistake. He's a young quarterback, and he's certainly going to do that. Yeah, and we said on, on the podcast this week that you need to make him, and I said the same thing when they played Michigan last week, you need to get him in, in situations where he is overthinking, he is pushed out of the pocket, and, uh, you know, I think this Indiana defense is very stout to do that. I think they, you know, they pose a good threat, threat especially with the defensive line. Mikhail Kamara, James Carpenter, and then the safeties and corners pushing down on blitzes and stuff like that. So where will the Michigan State defense hurt Indiana? Um, I don't know, and that continues to be a, a talking point from week to week, and we've talked about it on the podcast. And I don't know how you beat Indiana. I, I have no idea how you beat Indiana. The point gets brought up every week is where does this Indiana team get beat by opposing teams? How, where are they going to fall apart? I don't know. I, I, I seriously, I love everything on that defensive line. Like you said, the secondary is really starting to come along nicely with Pons having a couple big interceptions a week ago. Jameer Johnson starting to play, play better. So everything is starting to mesh for this Indiana team. I really don't, I don't know how Michigan State or any team on the rest of the schedule is going to, to, to get the best of Indiana. Yeah, we don't know until it happens. And, I mean, honestly, Ohio State is probably the only team that has, you know, go, a good, you know, predictable chance of getting this team, you know, in, in places where they can't make plays or getting them off balance and stuff like that. Uh, if, if we come back from East Lansing and Michigan State has won the game, we do not have a nine win Deanna yet, what, what will the storyline be? Um, the storyline will be that. Indiana's 8-1 and one with college football playoffs still very much in play. Obviously, you don't want to go into this loss kind of with this mini gauntlet of, of Ohio State and Michigan if you're still considering Michigan a tough opponent at home. Um, you absolutely don't want to go and, and, and suffer a loss here. I think that that would be, it'd be pretty def deflating. Um, there would be different scenarios where maybe you're 6-2 and two at this point. You go on the road and loss and you're taking things away. You're 8-0 now. The expectation is to go in and get a win. The expectation is compete for a Big Ten championship. The expectation is becoming making the college football playoff. A playoff team doesn't go and lose this game. And if you're Indiana, what are you going to harp on the most to win this game? Again, Curtis Rourke will play this week. So, I mean, with the Spartan run defense, does that, you know, open up a pass a little bit more before the game even starts to even feel out what's happening? I, I look back at the Nebraska game, and Nebraska was supposed to be this tout defense up front. They were giving up about 85 rushing yards a game going into that. Indiana rushed for 220-plus. I'm not really concerned about the defensive line for them. Uh, Jordan Turner is also going to miss the first half of this game. He, was, uh, he went out with a targeting uh, penalty last game against Michigan. So I think that's going to be huge. Get it going on the ground with Ellison and Lawton. I really love the running back duo in Indiana. Um, and you're getting Curtis Work back. So... So much going That opens right up for, the pass on right, its own. 100%. 100%. And, and just so many great receivers as well with Elijah Surratt, Omar mm -hmm. Cooper, Keyshawn Williams, just to name three. Right. So many so many dangerous playmakers on this team. Need a prediction before we get out of here? I'm going to go Indiana 48, Michigan State 10. All right, we're back mm -hmm. to close out the show. Liv, after the spiel that Jet and I just put yes. on for the Michigan State preview, what is the biggest talking point when it comes to places where the Hoosiers slip up in this game? 
Yeah, I think where they could slip up is just getting in their heads when it comes to um when it comes to that offense, when it comes to the QBs. I think if Curtis Work is in, they could have that flow, but I don't want them to overprotect him. I think that could be the big thing is if he's back in the game, he's fine and go 100% and go for it. If Taven's in and they feel a little bit rocky with him, it's also fine. Just go with the flow and go with it because he has experience behind him. Let's not forget the year he had last year. Was it great? No, but he has experience already. So I feel like the big key is they could get in their heads about the offense trying to get a flow together, but I feel like they'll be fine. The defense is always strong. Don't really worry about them, especially with D'Angelo Pons last game. He was just on it, and let's just give claps to him. But I think this game specifically, they just need the offense to flow, and they usually do, but it's been changing up a little bit. So, and Michigan State's defense is good, so you have to watch out for that also. Right. What about what about Michigan State, you know, scares you? You talked a lot about in-house Hoosier mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. But what about Michigan State? I think what worries me about Michigan State is when they're on, they're on. When that team is working together, it is a force, Couldn't and they're all of a sudden it's connecting, and everything's working out for them, especially with that quarterback. And he's had really good games, and he has struggled also. So I feel like if IU goes into it, maybe just undermining them a little bit, it could be awful. Because when Michigan State's working, especially at home, then it's just on. And so that's the big thing, is they can either be a powerhouse or they can be a weak point. So I feel like it would just depend, mm. but you'll know in that first two plays of them being out there what right. they're on. And outside of the, I mean, they're returning, they're, they're leading tackler, Jordan Turner. Right. You don't really know anybody else, mm-hmm. and they're still very a very good defense. Yeah. That's because they're so well coached, Joe Rossi, the defensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. Is it prediction time? It's prediction time. Go ahead. <laughs> I have 31-14, okay? I have 31-14. I don't think it'll be a blowout, but I've been saying that, and then IU just says, let me show you, Liv. I'm going to prove you something, so maybe it will be. But I do have IU winning. I think this will be a good game for them to get us some kinks out before going into Michigan and Ohio State, um, which will be two really, really crucial games for them. But I think Michigan State doesn't have all the components IU has. But I do see them getting in the end zone maybe early, but not in the second half. 31-14. Ryan, what's yours? I'll take 31-17. I think, oh, I think there we go. you know, <laughs> Curtis Rourke is going to restore order. And if he, mm-hmm. it, it, not even as if it was lost. Right. But uh, he's gonna, it's going to be a nice, you know, Chillaxed environment yeah. for for him to settle back in after surgery. I think the offensive line is going to be really, really good. One thing I will say is that it, if Indiana can't run the ball, mm. which there's a very good likely That's that mean. they can't with uh, this MSU defense, um, maybe get a little worried. But yeah. you know, we'll see how they open it up with the pass. That's fair. But for now, that's it. Enjoy your college football <laughs> Saturday. Hopefully, the next time we see you, Indiana will be nine and zero. Nine Woo! Indiana. We'll yes. see you later.